yeah, so some of the some of the slides didn't come out on the PDF, so I'll try to switch back and forth when it works. Um, thank you for the organizers uh, for the great invitation to this nice place. Um, I want to talk about joint work with uh, Dan Douglas, uh, postdoc at Yale, and Howlin. She is a grad student. And um, uh, please feel free to interrupt with anything. Uh, we don't necessarily talk the same language. <laughs> I'm not necessarily an integrable systems person, uh, at least for this talk. I'm taking off my integrable hat and putting on a probability hat. So I'm going to talk about some probability stuff. But uh, therefore, you're, feel free to interrupt about any silly question you may have. Um, all right. Here's the motivating problem, which did not show up. So I'm going to switch over to here. Right, we have a Riemann surface. A Genus two doesn't matter, uh, and I want to describe a, a uh, probability measure on curves, curve systems on the on the surface. So non-intersecting systems, which I call simple curve systems. A simple lamination is just a an isotopy class of uh, an isotopy class of simple closed curves on the on the surface. And uh, uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to be making actual closed curves on the surface. Uh, but uh, for this talk, I'm going to only care about the isotopy class uh, of those curves. And I want to pick a random set of curves on my surface. Uh, of course, there are many ways to do that, but I want a, um, an, a, a I'm going to construct a certain natural probability measure, which arises from the uh, Laplacian determinant or the determinant of the uh, D-bar operator, the Dirac operator, uh, in kind of a non-trivial way. And uh, this is, you know, there's there's some precedent here which is the kind of a deep mathematical formula, Selberg trace formula, which writes the determinant of the uh, Laplace Beltrami operator as a sum over closed geodesics for this, uh, for the underlying hyperbolic metric of some function of the length of the geodesic. That's kind of a, a deep and complicated theorem from scatter, you know, scattering theory. Um, but, uh, you know, the determinant is, uh, it's, it's already hard to define the determinant of some, some continuous operator. The determinant is really something you want to apply to a discrete, to a finite dimensional matrix, right? And uh, uh, so our measure is going to come from some finite matrices, take their determinant, and then we're going to take some sort of limit. Uh, we've taken a graph, we're going to take a graph on the surface, we're going to take a limit as the graph gets finer and finer, uh, appro approximating the surface in a, in a certain conformal way. And the, the resulting object will not depend on that sequence of graphs, uh, and uh, uh, it'll give us a nice probability measure. Okay. Uh, where's the integrability? Uh, it's hiding, <laughs> but uh, hopefully you'll see it in various places. So the and and you know before I even tell you what the measure is, let me just tell you one of the one of the calculations you can do. Uh, let's just take a square torus, right? That's like the simplest, the starting point, simplest Riemann surface, square torus. Uh, and, you know, what's a closed curve system is just a spot, you know, if the, if the curves are going to be disjoint from each other, then they all have to be parallel. And they're going to have some homology class I comma J, where I and J are relatively prime. So I got some number of curves of homology class I, J, and these are going to be unoriented curves. So I, J are minus I minus J, they're going to count for the same. Uh, and then the probability of this thing is going to turn to be uh, some very nice, uh, simple function of, of the homology class, right? Uh, so you can see that um, sort, sort of, if you do things in a natural way, the, you would expect the result to be some sort of nice sort of number theoretic uh, quantity a, a, at the end of the day. Of course, I, I have to, so now, uh, let me talk about dimers. What's a dimer cover? So I have a, 
this is a combinatorial mm, object. Uh, you take a finite graph, like a, like a grid in, in, the, in the current talk, all my graphs are just gonna be the square grid uh, uh, or a grid on a surface. And uh, a, a dimer cover is the same thing as a perfect matching. It's just a way to pair up the vertices, each vertex being paired with the nearest neighbor, just like you see here. Uh, and of course, for a finite graph, there may be a very large number of possible pairings. Uh, and in fact, the number of dimer covers of this n by n grid has this kind of amazing uh, formula uh, which, you know, is, uh, well, mysterious formula, let me say, right? The, uh, if, I, if I change the rules a little bit and I, and I try to study random tilings with some other kinds of slightly con different kinds of tiles, there's no, there's no such formula. The, there's something the special about the dimer model or this perfect matching model for planar graphs that you can, there's a, there's a method that I will tell you on the next slide that computes the number of dimer covers with the determinant of a certain matrix. And you can already see uh, some remnant of integrability here. There's a little spectral curve, uh, uh, which is somehow hiding in this, in this sum of two cosines here uh, in the background. And it, yeah? If n is odd, then, then n plus one is even. So one of the terms will be zero and you'll find that there are no time links. Okay, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a perfectly good question. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully I, I didn't make a mistake in writing that formula down, but that, 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 that's the formula. Sorry, what? Uh, yeah, you, you, you shouldn't, I mean, uh, here I is the square root of minus one, the G and K are just indices running from one to N. Uh, you know, there's some matrix here whose determinant I'm computing, and these are the eigenvalues of that matrix. So, so the J and K don't necessarily, co don't correspond to lattice points here. It's, but I'm, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a Fourier transform of the adjacency matrix of this graph. In fact, uh, that's the next, uh, Okay, well, <laughs> I guess I'm gonna to have to go this way. Uh, how do you count dimer covers? This is a nice uh, combinatorial theorem, you know, from the 60s by... They proved that if you wanna count the number... Does anybody know why the mic keeps stop, stopping and... <laughs> It's a determinant of a certain matrix. If your graph is plain, for a planar graph, the number of dimer covers is the determinant or the Fafian of a certain matrix. And for the square grid, it's just a determinant. And so uh, that matrix is, is nowadays called the Castellane matrix. It's a matrix whose uh, you know, rows index the white vertices. It's a bipartite graph and the columns index the black vertices. And you know, it's just essentially the adjacency matrix, except you put in some signs. So the adjacency, adjacency matrix of, the, of this graph, right? There's a, it's indexed by vertices and the entries are one or zero, depending on whether the vertices are adjacent or not. And except, except you put some signs in and the choice of the signs is, is given here. When you have a face, the, 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 you have to put the signs in so that around the every face, the number of signs depends on the parity of the face. So if the face has uh, uh, zero mod four, edges, then you have to have an odd number of minus signs. And if it has two mod four edges, seven signs. Uh, so so for, this is an example of such a matrix. So around every square face, I've got an odd number of minus signs. And you know, this, the signs are made so that when you expand the determinant as a sum over the, all the, the correct sign. Normally when you take the determinant, there's some, so the signature of the permutation, uh, you know, comes in, but th these signs here sort of cancel that signature. To, so all the terms add up with the correct sign and all the terms which are non-zero correspond to perfect matchings. Every, every non-zero term in the determinant is a way to pair up a white vertex with an adjacent black vertex. Okay. What are the what? 
Oh, what is a face? I, I just mean that it's a planar graph, uh, and each face is a one of the one of the complement components of the graph, which is embedded in the plane. That's what I mean by a face. The length is the number of edges around the face. The combinatorial length of the face is just the number of uh, edges. So that yeah, a face of length l uh, has l over two plus one mod two minus sign. So here all the faces are are four. So I sh I could have said. Uh, you know, every face has an odd number of minus signs, but the state, <laughs> this, sorry, I apologize. The statement here is, works for a general bipartite planar graph, but uh, in, I'm just illustrating it for the case of a, of a square grid. Does that help? Yeah, this one has nine faces. Well, you, you're allowed to include the outer face, but, the, but, well, the last face, the outer face will automatically satisfy this condition if the, if the other faces do as well. Okay, so there's this pretty simple way to count configurations, you know, with a determinant. And uh, like in Misha's talk, uh, you know, determinants play a role uh, in certain kinds of integrability. There's a, there's a, there's a cluster structure lying in the background of this of this dimer model, planar dimer model, uh, and the determinants are play the key play the key role because because we can count things with determinants we can we can we can be very sophisticated about understanding the behavior of this of this model. Let me just go back to that picture. Yeah, it's actually an eight by eight matrix because it's just it's rows are indexing the whites and the white vertices and columns indexing the black vertices. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, eight by eight matrix. Your computer can compute the determinant very quickly, uh, uh, and uh, because of the the matrix has this nice regular structure, you can diagonalize that matrix fairly readily with a little bit of work, and that's where this uh, formula comes from. Uh, here, for a square for the square grid, uh, there's a ni reasonably nice diagonalization of that matrix, and this will this will fall out. Right? It's not you know it's not obvious that this is even comes out to be an integer, but it is an integer. It's a number of tilings of that uh, number of dimer covers of that graph. Now we can try to ask more. I mean, who really cares about the number of Tilings, right? The, the, the interesting thing from a, of a probabilistic or a stat mech point of view is what's the behavior of a large tiling? We want the graph to get very large and say, you know, if we put a if we put if we put this tile in, how does that influence the tiles far away? Right? If, if this tile is, is here, what's the probability how does that affect the probability of some tile somewhere else? Right? That's a kind of classic, you know, typical uh, uh, problem that we'd like to, from a, from a probabilistic point of view, we'd like to understand, you know, the influence, uh, how, does the, how does the shape of the boundary affect the shape of the, uh, the tiling? Is it always homogeneous? Is there some, you know, internal structure to these tilings? Those are the kind of questions we, we care about. And, you know, those all can be answered. Those all have been answered because of this very simple determinantal structure to the set of tilings. Uh, and, you know, I put a slide about the integrability, but, uh, okay, let me, <laughs> since I'm going, let me just, I, I'm not going to talk about this. This is not going to be relevant for the rest of the talk, but I just wanted to show that, you know, uh, uh, there is some integrable structure for a general graph, right? So suppose I have some periodic graph with a more complicated fundamental domain, right? This is, this is a, this is my fundamental domain. So you imagine repeating this uh, periodically for the whole square grid then and put some uh, variables on the faces these are my uh, parameters in the in and then from that i can build a certain integral system and and the underlying Poisson structure in terms of these parameters is indeed this uh, has this log canonical form like misha was talking about where the the epsilon ij is just depend on whether the there's variables on the faces and the epsilon ij depends on whether the faces are adjacent or not. And you know, everything is sort of explicit. On 
spectral curve. Uh, okay, never mind. This is just a slide to to. That's right. Epsilon is yeah. Epsilon is plus or minus. They're adjacent and zero if they're not adjacent. Yeah. So there's an explicit Poisson structure. There's some explicit Hamiltonians. Everything you can compute with determinants. And, uh, and uh, this is just a slide to show you that you know I'm at the right conference or you're. <laughs> okay. So now, uh, 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 rather than just, it's a little bit easier to to talk about double dimers uh, in terms of long range uh, quantities. I mean, so if I take a second uh, dimer cover, just independent of the first one, and I just overlay it on top of the first one, then I get uh, now every vertex has two uh, neighbors, one, one blue and one green, but I'm gonna forget the colors. And then, but you can see that the, you know, the configurations form these loops. And those are the loops that I care about. Uh, that, that, that you might care about. So I'm going to just just do this thing of overlaying two random dimer covers and forget the colors uh, and ask about that system of loops. Now I've got a system of loops on my region in the plane, or, or if, if I'm working on a Riemann surface, you can imagine system of loops on a Riemann surface, and I can ask what are their, you know, uh, homotopy types of those loops. It's a random set of loops. Of course, uh, the, the, everything here is sort of a discrete, uh, and I'm interested in going from some limit as the right. I want to I want to put this on some Riemann surface. Put my put my sort of very very fine graph on a Riemann surface, and take the limit as the as the mesh size here goes to zero, and and the the magic uh, of this model is that the is well okay. Is that the the limit? I get some loop probabilities turn out to be uh, only depend on the conformal structure of the Riemann surface that I started with, as long as my graph is embedded in a in a nice way. So yeah. So more specifically for this talk, uh, I, I thought I would. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> right. Even even working in the plane, right? Even before I put it on a Riemann surface, I could just take my square and puncture some of the faces, like put a puncture here and here and here, and ask what's the probability that my loop has a particular homotopy class in the complement on that punctured disk. Right. That's a that's a you know very simple kind of event that you might care try to care about, and right. So what's the probability that loop in the Lamer cover on 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 the disk on some my Riemann surface has a particular homotopy class, right? That's that's a can we use our determinantal structure to compute these things? And uh, one of the reasons we uh, we like this model is that these probabilities actually have uh, can be, have a limit in the limit as a lattice spacing tends to zero limit when the mesh size goes to zero. That's called the scaling limit. And the limit only depends on the conformal structure, it doesn't depend on the geometry, even though the, you know, the way I embed the graph on the surface is, is quite a bit geometric. The graph has a, has a, has a geometry, but uh, uh, in, the, in the limit, the, the geometry sort of disappears. That's, that's called universality in StatMec. The, the, the local details of what graph you're using uh, wash out in the in the scaling limit, and you only and you get something in the end which only depends on the uh, conformal structure on the Riemann surface. Yes, exactly. Take two. I, I take my graph on my Riemann surface. I just overlay two independent, uniform, random dimer covers. Exactly. So, uh, is everybody with me? Any questions? Any more questions? So now I'm going to show you how how I can compute these probabilities and uh, the probabilities of these kind of events using some uh, uh, slightly more sophisticated determinants. And so what I'm going to do is uh, is uh, use an SL2 SL2C or SL2R 
local system that I impose on the graph. What is that? What does that mean? It just means a, a connection on a on a on a bundle on a vector bundle on my graph. Of course, uh, at the end of the day, the graph is on a Riemann surface, so I could think of it uh, having a, a connection. In fact, it's going to be a flat connection on the Riemann surface, which I restrict to the graph. But uh, uh, I'm I'm happy to work in the in the discrete setting. So uh, on my graph, I've got a vector bundle, which means that you know over each vertex, I've just got a vector space. And then on each edge, I've got an isomorphism between the corresponding vector spaces. So it's a very sort of elementary type of vector bundle, discrete discrete vector bundle with a connection. And in fact, my connection is going to be an SL2 connection. That's important uh, for this talk. Uh, and OK, so now when I have a loop on the graph, I can compute the monodromy of, that, of the connection around that loop. Uh, uh, that's a, uh, a uh, a matrix I associate to a loop with a with a with a base point, and um, okay, like I said, we're going to assume that the that our our connection is flat, so we have trivial monodromy around each uh, tractable cycle. So around every face of my graph, the monodromy is trivial. And um, uh, now, when I have a right, there's a picture. <laughs> When I have a double dimer configuration, right? A double dimer configuration is, is this sort of uh, big mess of loops, but most of them are are very small and and trivial, so they don't really contribute, uh, or rather, they can each loop contributes a factor of two because the monodromy is a uh, is trivial. The trace of the of the identity matrix for SL two is just two. However, if I have a non trivial loop, it's going to it's going to have a monodromy. The, 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 I take the trace of its monodromy, which doesn't depend on the place where I start, and it also doesn't depend on the orientation. In SL2, the trace of the inverse of a matrix is the same as the trace of a matrix, so uh, this is really an unoriented qu quantity I associate to an unoriented loop, the trace of the of that loop, and so I can the weight of my double dimer configuration as the product over all of its loops of the trace of the monodromy around is that loop. Maybe I should go back here uh, uh, to this picture. You know, if if I look at this picture and I forget the colors, right? You know, I, I recover in a green dimer cover and I overlaid them. But now I suppose I forget the colors. You know, everything is gray, and each loop, you know, has two ways it can be it, it, two. There's two ways you can you can uh, cover it can come from two dimer covers. I can have green blue or blue green. So each loop kind of has a preimage of uh, you know comes from two different dimer covers. And so the if I if I gray out this picture, then the the set of dimer covers which which will give the same double dimer cover is exactly two to the number of cycles. I said that at some point, uh, but uh, oh yeah, it's here. I missed saying that. Right, uh, the probability of a of a double dimer cover is is proportional to two to the number of loops. That's that was for the flat connection, but now the probability is going to be more. Uh, well, I mean, now I'm going to measure my double dimer covers with this more more sophisticated quantity, which which has these matrices in it, has these traces in it. And the the goal is to use this use the connection to detect the homotopy type of the loops, right? I'm, I, you know, when I look at my double dimer cover on this surface, right? It might have some loop uh, like that and some loop like that or whatever. And the if it has a, a topologically non-trivial loop then I'm going to get a non-trivial contribution to this trace, which I can use that, and I can use that to detect where the loop went. As long as I can, if I choose an appropriate uh, SL2 connection. Yeah. Different from two, yes, that's right. Every topologically trivial loop contributes two. A, a loop which is topologically non-trivial will contribute the trace of the monodromy of the connection around that loop. So if I choose my connection carefully, I could detect 
uh, loops uh, of a particular, well, and, but, you know, that's a non-trivial uh, uh, statement. How do we detect the traces of the loops from the connection? Uh, and how do we do the calculation? Well, uh, like I said, there's this theory which counts configurations with a determinant. Well, you can sort of extend that theory to, uh, if I have an SL2 local system fee, what that means just a, you know, a rank two bundle with an SL2 connection, then I can make a new matrix. This is still a finite matrix because uh, it's indexed, it's still indexed by the vertices, except now the entries are going to be themselves elements of SL2 or rather, you know, two by two matrices. It's a matrix of matrices, if you like. On every edge of my graph, I, do, I no longer just have a one or a zero. I've got the, I've got the connection. Let's say the connection going from black to white. The, the connection matrix, which is an S matrix. So I, I get this new matrix of matrices, the sort of castling type matrix. Four, but uh, you know, I can't take the determinant of such a matrix. It doesn't make sense because the entries don't commute anymore, but I can just, you know, replace each matrix with this two by two array of real numbers uh, and then take the determinant of the, of the new larger matrix. And that's the, that's the, that's the theorem, which is that uh, you take your, your matrix, your Castellane matrix, you remove all the inner parentheses. So it just, uh, because each two by two entry is now, you know, become a two by two block of matrices. And the determinant of that new matrix uh, counts exactly what you want. It's the sum over all double dimer covers of the graph. Double dimer covers now, that's what the means. And each double dimer, double dimer cover has a, has, a, has a weight, which is the, the trace, the product of the traces of its loops. So uh, this is just a, an extension of the Castellane theory to instead of scalar, instead of the scalar adjacency matrix, it's this matrix adjacency matrix. And, uh, and it's counting something, count something. Okay, so now uh, most of the work is done. We're just gonna take this, this is now a, almost what we want. It's a sum of all configurations and each configuration is, instead of counting to the number of loops, counting this, this product of traces. So we can now uh, <clears throat> regroup this sum. Suppose we're interested in the, the the probability of a certain kind of loop or a loop system on our Riemann surface, we can regroup this sum according to the isotopy class of the loops, right? So uh, yeah, each of these double dimer configurations is, has a collection of loops and regroup this sum in according to the isotopy classes of the set of non-trivial loops that appear. So, uh, uh, Right, so capital lambda is this is a surface, and this determinant now is a sum over all possible isotopy contaminations, some coefficient times the uh, times the weight of that lamination. Because my connection is flat, this trace only depends on the isotopy class of the lamination. Right, and so if I'm interested in the probability of a particular loop or a particular set of loops, all I need to do is figure out what this coefficient is here. So I need to extract this coefficient from this determinant, right? This determinant is a sum of, well, a finite sum over simple lamination types. Uh, and each lamination has a certain weight, the trace, and there's some coefficient, which that's the unknown quantity, and that'll determine the probability that it, I have a particular isotope. The probability that my double dimer model has a particular topological type is just given by this coefficient normalized. And uh, well, uh, wouldn't it be nice if these, these trace functions, as you vary the connection, if these trace functions were somehow independent of each other, then you would be able to extract. And that is in fact what happens. Uh, uh, that's the theorem of Falk and Goncharov that the traces of simply simple laminations by simple lamination, I just mean a simple closed curve system 
they in fact form a linear basis for the, for the space of regular functions on the character variety of SL2, SL2 character variety on, on my surface. Therefore, E lambdas are, can be determined. The, a corollary, C lambda can be uh, extracted because, because these functions, as you vary the connection, are linearly independent. And in fact, they form a basis, although we don't really need that part. They can be determined by the determinant of the, the, of the matrix. On the other hand, uh, you know, they, they don't tell you how, uh, how to extract these C lambda because these, these, these functions here are not sort of orthogonal with respect to any nice uh, quadratic form or anything. So uh, it's not clear at, at the moment, and we're still thinking about this, how we can, you know, algorithmically extract the coefficient from the, from that expression. Is that, is that okay? Any questions? Um, but here, here's an example anyway. Uh, in certain cases, we can do it. Uh, here's an ex here's here's going back to our square torus, right? I took I took my torus. I took a very fine square grid there, with mesh size epsilon, and let epsilon go to zero. Then I can ask, you know, what's the probability of a particular uh, lamination type? Uh, and if, here you can actually work out things because the fundamental group is abelian here. Uh, you can use some Fourier analysis to, to work everything out. Uh, and in fact, the, the coefficient extraction is, is kind of straightforward. And that's where, this, the, that's, the, that's where the statement is that I showed earlier came, came from. The probability that you have K curves of a particular homology class does come out to the, be this nice, you know, theta function like quantity. Uh, Um, how are we doing on time? Oh, really? Great. Okay, so I can go. <laughs> I was thinking that would take a long time. Uh, do we have any questions? I haven't talked about webs yet. Yes. Oh yeah, it's it's the same. It's just that the you know you get the analogous. Which will depend on tau, the conformal modulus of that of that torus. I didn't write down the general formula. It's almost the same. But you know, as soon as you do it on a on a you know higher genus surface, uh, you know there are problems. We we don't know how to extract the coefficients because there's some uh, it's a non-abelian fundamental group, uh, and in fact, the, computing the determinant is also difficult. So there's sort of two two hurdles to still overcome. I mean, we can prove that the, the result only depends in the limit on the conformal structure, but uh, we don't know how to do that coefficient extraction. But you know, undeterred by those hurdles, we can just uh, 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 go on and now, rather than con consider just two dimers, let's superimpose n copies, n, n independent dimer covers. Right, so here's here's a case with three. So I took a red, a blue, and a green uh, dimer cover and just drew them on top of each other. And of course, you get this kind of mess, this kind of uh, web of a uh, of a uh, subgraph, a subgraph with mul multiplicity. Uh, right, uh, what we get is we call this an n multi web. Right, so it's a multi set of edges. That means that each edge has some multiplicity, which is zero, one, two, or three. Now. And, and at each vertex, the, the sum of the multiplicities of the adjacent edges adds up to three. All right. And you can ask the same kind of questions, right? If I put some punctures in, or if, I, if I'm on a Riemann surface, what is the sort of topological type of this object? Uh, and it looks, looks a little bit messier. Um, but uh, I want to explain that it's, it's actually, there's something interesting going on, at least for the case n equals three. Uh, but uh, before I do that, the, uh, here's, here's kind of the most recent result about the, that we can in, indeed uh, uh, count configurations in the following sense, right? If, if we put SLN local system now on our graph, that means uh, instead of two by two matrices, I've got N by N matrices on the edges. Uh, 
the there's, a, there's an analogous determinant of, of the Castellini matrix and it counts uh, the right thing. It's a sum of configurations are these n tuples of uh, dimer covers, uh, the n, n multi-webs. And, and now each multi-web counts with a trace. Uh, but this trace is a more complicated object now uh, because uh, uh, each web is some sort of tangled, uh, complicated graph. What's the, how do you of a complicated graph in the presence of a, of a connection? That's what I have to explain now. And you know, this is not a new, this, this, this trace is not a new definition. It's a, it's, a, it's a trace which people from you know, geometric invariant theory invented long ago. But let me just explain how to define the trace of a, of a multi-web. Uh, and let's just, let me just stick with the case n equals three for simplicity. Um, yes? The right-hand side where, up here? Right, n is the, it's an n-fold dimer cover, right? So it's an n multi-graph, n multi-web, multi right? Omega n is the space of n multi-web. What's an n multi-web? It's a, it's a multi-set of edges, which sums to n at each vertex. No, they're not loops, exactly. Right, I mean, you can see that this, this, this component here has lots of, uh, Trivalent vertices and so on. Yeah, it's just sum over multi-webs, but I have to define what the what the trace of a multi-web is. That's what I'm defining now. Right. If it's a loop, the trace of a multi-web is just the trace of the connection around the, if it's an oriented loop, the, the trace of the multi-web is an, uh, is the trace of the matrix, the trace of the monodromy. But if it's a if it's if it has a non-trivial topology, the trace is more complicated and it has this sort of tensor network definition, which is here. So, uh, and I'm just giving you the n equals three case. So now we've got a rank three bundle. So at each vertex, I've got a three dimensional vector space and along each edge, I've got a uh, SL3 matrix connecting those two. Now I'm gonna push, uh, I'm debating whether to skip this slide or just, or let's just go, go through it anyway. Uh, you, you uh, at each vertex, you, so you push the, vert the, the vector space onto each edge. So each sort of half edge gets a vector space. Each edge gets two vector spaces, a, you know, V and V and a dual vector space near the black, at, at, near the black vertex. Uh, and at a vertex, you're gonna, you're gonna look at the tensor product of those three vector spaces. And in that tensor product, you pick a particular vector uh, V, uh, which is this sort of co-determinant vector defined here. Uh, let me just sort of slough over this part a little bit. You associate a, a vector in the, the tensor product of the three vector spaces and likewise at the black vertices. And then you just take the, Along each edge of a matrix, track these these tensors along each edge, and when you do the all the contractions, you get the trace. There's some sort of tensor network definition here, which is very very concise, but uh, it's a little bit mysterious, I admit. Uh, but here, yeah, here's an example. Let me just go through the example. Uh, Suppose this is a very simple web, right? It's just got two vertices and three edges between them with three matrices A, B, and C. What's the trace of this? Oops. What's the trace of this uh, of this uh, web? Well, at this vertex, I have a certain tensor, which is in the a certain vector, which is in the tensor product of the three vector spaces here, and it's this. It's got six terms. It's like this co-determinant, which has six terms here. E. E1, R, E2, G, E3, B. So R, G, and B are the, are the basis vectors for each vector space. I call them R, B, and G because there's too many indices otherwise, right? Because there's three vector spaces, each of dimension three. And so, you know, <laughs> figuring out which index goes with which vector space was, was, was difficult. But if you, 
if you label each vector, each vector space has a basis consisting of ER, EG, and BEB. So you can think of red, green, and blue vectors. Then uh, anyway, this is the this is the tensor sitting at this vertex. There's a tensor sitting at that vertex, and you just do the contraction of these two tensors using the two three matrices A, B, and C. And it turns out, you know, that there's like 36 terms here because there are 36, you know, this 36 pairs. You get this big sum, sum of 36 matrix entries to rewrite uh, in terms of the actual traces of some matrices A, B inverse, trace of C, B inverse minus trace of A, B inverse, C, B inverse. Okay, so that the trace of this web comes out to this slightly non, non obvious combination of actual matrix traces uh, of the monodromies here. And it's not hard to see that this is invariant under you know, gauge transformation for the connection. If you like, there's a sort of much more symmetric way to write this, uh, this web trace as the determinant, you take the determinant of XA plus YB plus ZC, and then think of that as a polynomial in XYZ and extract the coefficient of the XYZ uh, term, monomial. Okay, so anyway, the, so associated to every web, not just this one, any sort of trivalent graph, there's this uh, complicated object called the trace, uh, and you sum those up, uh, and that's what the determinant is counting. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Any, the trace of any web is expressed a sum of products of traces of some loops running through that web. Uh, but, but here, in fact, you'll see it here in the next. But, yeah. Right, there's some uh, basic skein relation for webs. If you have this, a, a web, at least for n equals three here, uh, uh, and the trace of any web can be, sorry. Yeah, if you want to compute the trace of this complicated topological web, you can use this skein relation, which is to, which reduces the, the this, this is part of, a, this, this on the left is part of, a, imagine that there's stuff connected to each of these vertices, uh, but uh, because it's trivalent, uh, you know, you take two adjacent vertices, it, it looks locally like this, you can replace this, Web with two web, which both both of which are simpler than the first one. So that's the basic scheme relation. And if you compute the trace of this web, it'll be equal to the trace of the, the this web minus that web. Uh, and so you can use this relation to compute the trace of some complicated web in terms of simpler webs. Eventually, you boil it down to a bunch of loops, or, and then a trace of a loop is just the trace of the monodromy around the loop. And uh, uh, since our, our graph is locally planar, it's, it's after all on a surface, you know, the, as a consequence of this relation, there's some plane, right? The, this skein relation doesn't preserve planarity because there's, there's this crossing here, but uh, there are, there's some, uh, there's some other reductions to preserve the planarity. And, and the interesting one is this one, which, by which you take a square face and, and replace it with two simpler connections like that. But so the, 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 the net result is that if you're trying to compute the trace of this complicated web, you can re, if, if the web is on a surface or, or, or if it's on the plane, you can use this sort of planar reductions to, to reduce to, a, to a, a, a set of cycles. And the set of cycles, the trace is just a product of the, the, the matrix traces of the monodromies. Okay. Always non-crossing, yes. If if the graph was planar, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, there's the same uh, uh, the same story. Uh, oh, yeah. If if I have a three multi-web, if n equals three, then uh, I, I've got a surface with a flat connection. Then the trace of the web. Can be written as a as a trace of some simpler webs, which are called the, those simple simplest webs are called uh, reduced or non elliptic webs in in M. So every and the uh, 
unlike the case of SL2, you can't reduce every web to a collection of non-crossing curves. So, so I, I apologize, I, I said the wrong thing two minutes ago. Uh, but you can reduce a web to a bunch of so-called reduced webs and uh, the of the matrix, the Castellane matrix, SL2 case, it becomes a sum over isotopy classes of reduced webs with some, with some uh, coefficients. And those coefficients are, 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 can be then extracted. I mean, that's the theorem of Shikora and Westbury. Where's the theorem? Okay, I, I, I missed the theorem. Back up here, right here. Traces of reduced webs uh, can be, can, do form a basis of regular functions on the SL3 character variety. So basically the, what it means is that for SL3, the, the same story goes through and uh, then you can do the calculations. And I guess I'm out of time, but let me just throw up the formula for the case of the annulus, which is like the simplest possible surface. Uh, the, the determined, you know, when you look at a reduced web on an annulus, it's a bunch of oriented loops around the annulus, and there's some generating function as a function of the conformal type of the annulus tau uh, for the number of number of webs of each type. So I can't see, can't quite see the whole thing. There. So I will stop there. Thanks. Yes, yes. It's like e to the minus pi squared. If you have one loop which runs horizontally around, you just i equals one and k equals one and j equals zero. It's e to the minus pi over two. Uh, the, well, you have to divide it by this, uh, this uh, denominator. Which, which is the theta function. Kind of an interesting uh, calculation. Yes? Oh yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> it's always good when people allow you to continue your talk. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's this parameter Q, Q is a, e to the minus n over, this I took a sort of n by n grid on a torus, but the, the, the resulting expression only depends on the ratio n over m which is tending to the conformal modulus, right? So the, this, is, this expression is a, when you expand this out, it's a, it's a generating function. I mean, it's a, it's a power series in u and v with coefficients which depend on q of the conformal modulus. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Yes. 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 Yeah. So we right. So there's some Markov process on dimer covers where you, you know, take take two dimers like this and replace them with this, and uh, then you get some sort of dynamical Markov process on on loops. Yeah. No, no, that's a great question, but uh, you know we haven't got there yet. It's a you know, worth worth studying though. Yeah, and, and maybe Misha first. There's something which works for SL three, but doesn't work for for SL n n larger than three, which is this uh, notion of reduced webs, right? Uh, so, you know, nobody has a good uh, definition for reduced web, so we don't really know how to, how to, uh, 
Yes. And you had a question? Yeah. Any what? Yeah, if you change the if you change the lattice, it, right? It's rather than do a square grid, if I take a honeycomb grid or some other uh, planar bipartite graph, all the local probabilities will change. The probability of a you know, but the but the as long as you embed the graph on the surface in a conformally preserving way, the scaling limit of the loops will be the same. That's kind of the an amazing sort of universality. Uh, and basically, it's because uh, you know the this Castellane operator is converging in an appropriate sense to the D-bar operator on the with respect to the, the Beltrami Laplacian, essentially. Okay. Yes, you can certainly define the trace. Uh, and there are some skein relations, but the but there's no notion of uh, what it means to be reduced. So we can't do that regrouping of the of the determinant. Yeah, yeah. The appropriate coefficients are not uh, linearly independent anymore. 